Welcome, everyone, to Story Hour in the Library. Our normal introducer is on the phone right now because we're doing a Mark Twain celebration in two weeks, and uh, there's still a lot of coordination going on for that. But we are really pleased uh, to have Laura King here tonight. And in order to start it off properly, our host for Story Hour, Vikram Chandra, will now introduce her. Thank you. Um, and I should say um, what Beverly says every time, that um, we have a mailing list over there. If you'd like to get on it, uh, we can tell you what's coming up. And also, apparently, we're on Facebook. So join us on Facebook and become our friends. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to welcome Laurie King. Laurie was born in Oakland and spent the first few years of her life in Walnut Creek. Her family was moved so often by her father through Santa Cruz and San Jose and Tacoma, Washington, that she has written, it wasn't until high school that I entered the same school in September that I'd been in the previous June. By then, I'd more or less given up on the tedious process of making friends, since libraries were always nearby and books were much better companions anyway. I am a writer because I love and have been nurtured by books. As an undergraduate, she was a religious studies student at the University of California in Santa Cruz. Working her way through her BA took seven years, and she then enrolled for an MA here at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, up on Holy Hill, right? So, during this time, she married, had two children, and built homes, quite literally, that is. She dug foundations and raised frames, put in walls, and so on. You can see all of these activities, the religious and the architectural, reflected in her books. Her characters search for meaning and purpose. They're keenly aware of the structural design of the buildings and environments they move through. With her husband, a scholar of comparative religion, Laurie traveled around the world, to, including to uh, places like Papua New Guinea, Australia, Samoa, South America, and India. After she received her MA degree, again seven years in the making, she writes, I had two small children and a husband nearing retirement age. Entering a lengthy PhD program would have been irresponsible. Instead, to our great profit, one morning in 1987, while her ch young children were in school, Laurie sat down and wrote on a yellow pad the following sentence. I was 15 when I met Sherlock Holmes, 15 years old with my nose in a book as I walked the Sussex Downs and nearly stepped on him. These words, spoken by a young woman named Mary Russell, formed the first sentence of the story that was to later become the book, The Beekeeper's Apprentice. After that book was finished, Laurie kept writing. Th the third novel she wrote, titled A Grave Talent, was the first to find a publisher. The book is the first of a series fe featuring Kate Martinelli, a homicide inspector in the San Francisco Police Department. It won the Edgar Award for the best first novels from the Mystery Writers of America and the John Creasy Award from the Crime Writers Association. Laurie has since won the McCavity and Lambda Awards and been nominated for the Agatha, the Orange Prize, the Barry Award, and two more Edgars. Her, her output, including not only the Mary Russell and Kate Martinelli books, but also standalone novels have displayed a wide-ranging wide command over fictional form and content. It's an incredibly varied body of work, but as a Sherlock Holmes devotee, I'd like to speak a bit to Beekeeper's Apprentice. Um, after Mary Russell bumps into Sherlock Holmes on the Downs, this orphaned, tall, bespectacled, bespectacled teenager demonstrates to him that in intellect, perceptiveness, wit, and egotism, she is the great man's equal, and therefore a worthy apprentice. He has by this time retired to the countryside to pursue his studies in beekeeping and other arcane fields. But Britain is caught up in the horror of the Great War, and of course, crime never ceases. So Holmes and Russell, uh, this is how they address each other, are called upon to intervene in matters mighty and small. In an editor's preface at the beginning of the book, Laurie writes, the first thing I want the reader to know is that I had nothing to do with this book that you have in your hand. She goes on to tell us that what we are reading now is a slightly cleaned up version of a manuscript that arrived anonymously at her doorstep via UPS. Many rec readers will recognize this, of course, as a hewing to one of the central tenets of what might be called the cult of Sherlock Holmes, 
which insists that the great detective really existed. In an essay called Clap If You Believe in Sherlock Holmes, Michael Saylor proposes that this willing belief in a fictional character allows modern readers to re-enchant the world, to escape from the iron cage of reason. The paradox, of course, being that in this re-enchantment, that this re-enchantment happens through Holmes, an incarnation of a certain kind of rationality. In the Mary Russell books, this enchantment is stronger than ever. Much of this is because of Mary Russell, who in her independent feminism, her clear-eyed vision of Holmes brings to this hitherto male world a much needed complexity and skepticism, a keen awareness of much that is traditionally silent, silenced in the Sherlockian canon. But these adventures are also the education of Mary Russell in which she attempts to understand herself and the world, to know who she is and why she is alive. In Laurie's writing, I think, there is always the understanding that the detective story, which I think is perhaps the only truly modern form of fiction, is not just about mayhem and murder, but is also a questioning of morality, purpose, and meaning of the nature of reality and our relationship to it. Which is to say, it is a kind of theological inquiry, and in Laurie's hands, a very necessary one. Please, welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Laurie King. Well, thank you. Where, where, where to begin with that? Um, it's always a responsibility to be, to, to be credited with far, far, more, um, far more dignity than you, you're aware of when you're writing. <laughs> I, write, I write the stories and I'm always astonished that people find um, meaning in them. The, um, it's, it is quite interesting, the whole Holmes, the whole Holmes, um, industry um, that, that I've sort of backed into unknowing. Um, I, I am currently, although I have fought my publisher tooth and nail to be permitted to write something other than my dear friend Mary Russell, whom I, I, I am indeed quite fond of, but you know the saying of um, guests and fish in three days also applies to authors and characters in three books. Um, the third book is in the process, and I'm going to read you a bit of it in a bit. And I, I, I really said to them, I, if you don't want me to do some horrible thing to Mary Russell, you must let me write something else. <laughs> um, however, I find to my amusement that I've been dragged in um, by friends who are devout Sherlockians into the entire industry in ways that I hadn't expected. Um, I am a... Um, now a, an official member of Baker Street Irregulars. My, my investiture name is The Red Circle. Um, and I <clears throat> find that I'm doing not one, not two, but three books <laughs> in, this, in this industry. Um, a friend and I, uh, Les, Les Klinger, who does the, the new annotated Sherlock Holmes. Have you, uh, I'm sure you all read this at your, as your bedtime reading material. Um, anyone here with a broken nose, um, I can tell, has, has been reading Les's book at night. Um, but Les, Les dragged me in to do a centenary um, celebration of the game, the great game of, uh, of Sherlock Holmes scholarship, which indeed, as, as you, were, you, you were just told, the, um, the basic tenet of which is um, that indeed Sherlock Holmes was alive, that Arthur Conan Doyle was not a writer of fiction, he was a literary agent, and that, in fact, Sherlock Holmes must still be alive since his obituary has yet to appear in the Times of London. <laughs> so um, look f uh, on your, um, I won't say on your um, booksellers' shelves because you'll be hard pressed to find it, but a year from now you can probably track down a copy of Less in my book. We are also doing a, um, a fascinating um, anthology of um, Sherlock Holmes inspired stories um, with people such as Lee Child, Mike Connolly if we can pull his leg a little, um, Neil Gaiman, 
and uh, 18 other people, um, and that should be out in a year or so. Now, I started in this whole business by not writing a home story. I started by writing a young female feminist 20th century version of the great detective, Mary Russell. And what I had in mind with the book that eventually became The Beekeeper's Apprentice was to look at how that mind, that, that brain, if you regard the brain as a kind of engine, how it would differ if it were installed in a very different individual. So instead of being in a, um, a middle-aged Victorian male detective, um, a young woman um, who, who really has no intention of becoming a detective. Um, when, I, when I started writing it, my kids were, it was 1987, so my kids were seven and, uh, and four. And my son had just gone into preschool three glorious mornings a week. Um, there, there is life after small children. <laughs> and, um, and so I sat down and wrote this first sentence, not really knowing quite what I was doing. Um, and it was one of those extraordinary situations that any writer would give parts of their anatomy for, of having a character whose voice is instantly there. Um, a voice is something you can occasionally craft, you can occasionally swear at, um, you can jolly along and laboriously make, and sometimes you are gifted by having it just appear in your ears, as it were, um, without really thinking where it comes from. And that was where I, where I started with Mary Russell. Um, I was 15 when I first met Mary Russell. Um, and she, she more or less led me in that way. There's a kind of writer's shortcut, sh shorthand, where you're talking about the creation of plot and the creation of character, where people who, um, who write to very, very careful outlines um, think that it's a cute way of saying that those of us who don't write to outlines um, just cross our fingers and hope for the best. And although that's quite true, um, on the other hand, when I say that my characters um, take over and that I depend on them to take over, I'm not talking about being lazy or not understanding where the story is going. I'm talking about hoping for a sense of organic growth in, in the book and for a sense of a, a character so unique and vivid um, that there's very little that I, as a willpower, can do to change her personality. Um, and that was the case with Mary Russell. Now, I've written 10 books. Um, the 11th one will be out next September. And over the course of those 10 books, um, inevitably, the character changes. Because of course, when you first meet her, she's 15. And it's now 1924. And she's had um, 10, 10 volumes of her adventures under, under the bridge. But I found that in the last couple of books, um, her attitudes, her actions, and her voice itself were becoming rather dark. Um, when <clears throat> the, the last two books were more or less, uh, um, more or less connected. I mean, the, the language of bees ends with that dread phrase, to be continued, um, which only meant um, that there was one, one little element, <laughs> honestly, a little element that wasn't completely tied off. Um, people screamed anyway, but that's all right. Um, and that, that element went through and um, found its conclusion in The God of the Hive, the second of the, of the, the duality. It's, it, there's a problem in talking about a pair of books because there isn't a nice tidy phrase like trilogy or quartet. I mean, it, a duo just doesn't sound right, but the, the sequel of the other. Um, but in the course of those books, you, f you end up exploring an awful lot of the 
the past of these two characters. Um, now, before I wrote The Language of Bees, I had done another fairly dark book called Touchstone, um, which was my book on terrorism. I mean, I think a lot of writers <clears throat> who were active beginning in 2001 um, found themselves looking at this theme and seeing how they could, how they could work with it. Um, how it changed the way they looked at the world and how it changed how their characters would, would behave. Um, Touchstone was my book. Um, it's set in 1926 and it's set in Britain, but it is my book exploring the roots of terrorism and, and why people become terrorists. Um, one, of the, one of the advantages of writing historical fiction is that you can grapple with issues that are at a slight distance. And because they are off there rather than on, on your um, daily paper in front of you every morning, um, you, you can look at all sides of the issue in a way that you can't when you're faced with an immediate problem. Um, historical fiction is not historical because everything is finished. It's historical because it allows us distance and it gives us a reflection of what we're doing. But I had, as I said, Touchstone, um, and then the two Russells, the Language of Bees and God of the Hive. And I thought, I, I really cannot do um, another, uh, another straightforward, serious Russell. So I decided, I talked to my editor, and I said, look, if you're going to want me to do a third one, and you don't want me to end up with Russell in the hospital the whole time, um, I mean, those of you who have read the, um, the, the the Girl Who trilogy, you know how she starts out that third volume and spends most of that third volume, the hornet's nest one, in the hospital. Um, if, unless you want Russell in a similar situation, um, I need to do something very different. So I decided what I would do is, um, is write a farce, is write um, something just remarkably ridiculous. Um, and I, I, I think I'll read you a little bit of it just to give you a, a taste. Um, it'll be out, <clears throat> I think the pub date is the 6th of September next year. And two people have read it, my editor and my daughter. I recently gave it to her. And Zoe said that um, she found it really lovely to be back with, um, with Russell's lighthearted voice. So I think I've, I've managed to uh, hit the right note. This is the, this is the author's foreword, that is Mary Russell's foreword. I, I am not, in the same way that Arthur Conan Doyle was not the author of the Sherlock Holmes stories, I am not the author of the Mary Russell stories. I am her editor who makes, her, uh, makes the best she can of the, the woman's really, really abysmal handwriting. It comes in really handy when somebody writes me a letter saying that I got something wrong. I can, <laughs> I, I can blame Mary Russell's handwriting. <laughs> I find myself of mixed mind concerning this, the 11th volume of memoirs concerning my life with Sherlock Holmes. On the one hand, I vowed when I began writing them that the account would be a full one that there would be no leaving out failures or slapping wallpaper over flaws. Nonetheless, this is one episode over which I have considerable doubts. Not, let us be clear, due, due to any failures or humil <clears throat> humiliations on my part, but because I anticipate that many readers will find their credulity stretched to the breaking by its intricate and, shall we say, colorful complexity of events. If that be the case with you, dear reader, please rest, rest assured that for this one volume of the Russell Memoirs, you have my full permission to regard it, and alas, by contagion, me, as fiction. If I had not actually been there, I too would dismiss it as preposterous. Honestly, Holmes, pirates? That is what I said. You want me to go and work for pirates? My dear Russell, someone your age should not be having trouble with her hearing. Sherlock Holmes, solicitous, 
was Sherlock Holmes sarcastic. My dear Holmes, someone your age should not overlook trouble with incipient dementia. Why would you wish me to go and work for pirates? Think of it as an adventure, Russell. May I point out that this past year has been nothing but adventure. Ten back-to-back -back cases between us in the past 15 months stretched over, what, eight countries? Ten, I suppose, if one acknowledges the independence of Scotland and Wales. What I need is a few weeks with nothing more demanding than my books. You should, of course, feel welcome to remain here. The words seemed to contain a weight beyond their surface meaning. A dark and inauspicious weight. A mariner's albatross sort of a weight. I replied with caution. This being my home, I generally do feel welcome. Ah, did I not mention that Mycroft is coming to stay? Mycroft? Why on earth would Mycroft come here? In all the years I've lived in Sussex, he's only visited once. Twice, although the other occasion was before your arrival. However, he's about to have the builders in, and he needs a quiet retreat. He can afford a hotel room, I said bluntly. This is my brother, Russell, he chided. Yes, exactly, my husband's brother, Mycroft Holmes, whom I had thwarted blatantly with malice aforethought and with what promised to be considerable consequences scant weeks earlier, whose history I had learned held events that had soured my attitude towards him, who was capable of making life uncomfortable for me until he had tamped me back into my position of sister-in-law. How long, I asked. He thought two weeks, 14 days, 356 hours, 21,360 minutes, a first-hand opportunity to revenge himself on me, verbally, psychologically, or surely not, physically. Mycroft is a master of the subtlest of poisons. I speak metaphorically, of course, and 14 days would be plenty to wreak his revenge and drive me to the edge of madness. And only the previous afternoon, I had learned that my lodgings in Oxford had been flooded by a broken pipe, information which now crept forward in my mind, bringing with it a note of dour suspicion. No, Holmes was right, best to be away if I could, which brought us back to our beginnings. Why would I wish to go and work with pirates, I repeated. You would, of course, be undercover, naturally, with a cutlass between my teeth. I should think you would be more likely to wear a nightdress a nightdress. Oh, this was getting better and better. As I remember, there are very few parts for females among the pirates, although they may decide to place you among the support staff. Pirates have support staff? At this, I set my teacup back into its saucer that I might lean forward and examine his face. I could see no blatant indication of lunacy, no more than usual. He ignored me, turning over a page of the letter he'd been reading, keeping it on his knee below the level of the table. We could not see the writing, which was, I thought, no accident. I should imagine they have a considerable number of personnel behind the scenes, he replied. Are we talking about pirates on the high seas or piracy as violation of copyright law? Definitely the cutlass rather than the pen, he said, although Gilbert might argue for the literary element. Gilbert, two seconds later, the awful light of revelation flashed through my brain. At the same instant, Holmes tossed the letter onto the table so I could see its heading, headings, plural. For the missive contained two separate letters folded together. The first was from Scotland Yard. The second was emblazoned with the words, Doily Cart Opera. <laughs> the Pirates of Penzance. So, so what I decided I'd do to this poor, this poor female that I am in charge of is to get her involved in a movie about a movie about the Pirates of Penzance. Um, and, and, and I had a great deal of fun with it, as you can tell. Um, but it's, I mean, it's always a question when you're dealing with something like this, is how, how far do you go um, with the entertainment value. I mean, at a certain point, um, you have to decide, are you going in for slapstick or are you going for mild humor? Um, there's an awful lot of, of choice that I make with this kind of writing that I don't make when I'm writing one of the Martinellis, for example. Um, Kate Martinelli 
the, those books, I have five of those. Um, those books are written in a very straightforward American English. Um, they tend to have um, a fairly basic vocabulary, nothing terribly fancy. Um, they are in the third person. Um, and the Russells, on the other hand, are first person. They are written as if by a woman in her 80s when you first meet her, writing her memoirs in a very formal English, m more formal than certainly was spoken in the 20s in England, um, to the extent that a lot of people use a dictionary when they're reading the Russell books, um, which normally is not good. I mean, normally that is something that I would not be proud of writing because you don't want your writing to get in the way of, of the story, of the, um, the characters and what they're doing and how they're reacting. Um, in this case, Russell's language is a part of her personality and the fact that she uses pompous language and she uses whom rather than who um, is, is definitely a part of who she is. Um, so it's, um, it, it's, it allows me to pull out all the stops when I'm writing in a way that the, that the other books don't. Um, now, I am happy to talk about Russell um, for as long as you like, or I am happy to talk about any of the other books. Do you want to, um, do you want to give me a question and I will follow that in direction for a while? Or shall I just continue talking? Yes. Speaking of movies, um, who's approached you as, about? As we were speaking. <laughs> Um, the, the, the question is about um, Russell in the cinema. Uh, I, have not, um, I have not yet been written any checks. I often have conversations with my Hollywood agents who are into all kinds of things. Um, apparently the most recent uh, um, barricade to the Russell film w was that um, there was a change of governments in England. <laughs> <laughs> the United Kingdom now has a government that doesn't support the arts quite so thoroughly. And so um, the BBC had its budget cut. So, uh, you, you know, we're, we're all part of the big game, are we not? So, I, I, you know, all I can say is keep, keep an eye on the, on the website and when I know, you'll know. Yeah. Um, the, the question is, <clears throat> what led me to, to include um, Jewish and uh, uh, Chinese and other interesting characters in... Um, now, I think it, it, we as Americans tend to think of Britain, especially in the 20s, as being um, fairly monocultural. I mean, white, Anglican, middle-class churchgoers. Um, and in fact, that's, uh, that's always been, not always, but since, since Victoria came onto the throne, um, not really a description of what England has been. Um, so that even in the 20s, and especially in London, you would find a tremendous mix of cultures and people and religions and um, attitudes. Um, one of the things that, I, that I've had a lot of fun with is um, doing research into the 20s. And of course, I, uh, my background is academic, so that uh, I'm, what my, I'm what my daughter calls a recovering academic. Um, I, I, my natural inclination in writing anything is to put footnotes, because that's, that's a real book, has footnotes, right? Um, the fact that I don't write that kind of book has nothing to do with the research that I do. So that when I, when I first started writing the Russell books and realized that I had um, defined my time because the last of the Conan Doyle stories begins at the Great War. I mean, he, he comes to an end at the eve of the Great War. And after that, any Sherlock Holmes story is set beforehand. 
Conan Doyle couldn't get his mind around the idea of Holmes in or after the war. He just couldn't, he couldn't see a place, <clears throat> a place for Holmes in the society that existed, um, the hugely changed society that existed after the war. And I, I thought that was shortchanging the fellow. I thought that the character of Holmes was such that he would find a place and an activity and an identity pretty much anywhere. So that when I started writing the Russell books and realized that I was going to have to do some research not only on Sherlock Holmes, about whom I know, I, I knew at the time nothing, um, but also about the time. Um, I, I chose 1915 because that was, after that, he was free and clear. Conan Doyle had nothing more to say about him, so I didn't have to worry about weaving him back into the stories. Um, but to look at the, at the changes that went on in Britain from 1914 until the late 20s is fascinating. I mean, I, they are, in, in a lot of very peculiar ways, similar to what this country experienced in the 60s. We lost nowhere near the number of men in Vietnam, but as far as social changes going on, um, these enormous changes that, you know, that we experienced, they experienced in the teens and 20s. Um, and part of that is the influx of people from all over, all over the, the empire. Um, you have an awful lot of people that, for example, um, you know, Damien Adler, would have ended up in, in Shanghai, would have met any number of people. And um, the, you know, having, a, having a British passport, even a second class British passport, allowed you to, to come back to, to um, you know, London at some point. So um, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see these sides of Britain that are not expected by an American who doesn't really know Britain terribly well until, you know, until you start doing the reading about the time and the place. So, besides that, it, it enables me to, you know, if, I, if I'm doing research, I, I have to go to these places, right? <laughs> I mean, I have, to, I have to, to go and spend some time in, um, well, let's see. Pirate King takes place in Lisbon and Morocco, and I checked those off this spring. <laughs> um, the next book I'm doing will take place in Paris in the late 20s, and, uh, and that's on my calendar for this spring. And there was a reference in one of the Russell books about when they're coming towards San Francisco. Um, she makes reference to doing a, a job in Japan for the emperor. And funnily enough, um, 2012, I, I have um, plans to go to Japan. So <laughs> it's, it, it's really remarkable how, you know, how often one's characters um, have footsteps that follow the, the author. It, it, just an amazing coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The question is about the books that are up in the San Juans. Um, I wrote Folly. Um, <laughs> it, it started with the idea that the book before I had done an awful lot of research for, and I was, I was kind of burnt out with research, and so I thought, why don't I write something that I don't have to, to research, that I, that I already know something about? And looking around, um, I thought, well, you know, I know about raising kids. I know about sitting on the sidelines during soccer games. I know about canning tomatoes. And I know about building. And of those four things, probably the idea of building is, you know, has more, if you'll pardon the pun, doors that it opened up, <laughs> fiction-wise. Fiction um, so I, I thought I would write about a woman who, who builds and using that not only as an analogy but as a physical action. Um, she builds her house. She rebuilds her life. And to, to give it perspective, um, I wanted her to be on an island. I wanted her to be all by herself. And there's a limited number of islands accessible to me in, you know, Santa Cruz County. Um, whereas there are quite a few of them 
just hanging around waiting for fictional characters to drop down on them up in Washington State. Um, I spent part of my, part of my um, formative years in uh, living near, near Tacoma um, on Puget Sound. And so I had been up to the San Juan Islands any number of times. And so, um, and again, that was one of those really difficult pieces of research to go up to the San Juan Islands in September. Um, the, all the tourists go home the first of September. And after that, there's just gorgeous weather. And, and, and people looking around for something to do because there aren't any tourists to wait on. So you have the place to yourself. It's, it's really quite, quite a hard job. Um, but I, I liked that, um, that combination of solitude on an island and yet you are a part of this very, very tight-knit community um, because everyone there um, is in the same, sorry, boat as you, um, in that you, you all have to sort of keep an eye on each other. And once, once the tourists are gone in, in September, um, you catch up with your neighbors, even if you have to take a boat to see them. So I, I liked this idea, and I liked the character. Um, and I introduced a character towards the end of that that I also liked. And I thought, I had been playing with the idea for a while of writing a book from a man's point of view. And he seemed to fit what I, what I needed. So I have these two books, um, Folly and Keeping Watch, that are, th they're not, not really sequels, but they overlap. Um, at, eventually, there's going to be a San Juan cycle. There will be those two books. There will be a book about um, probably Jerry the Sheriff. Um, the, the character I really am looking forward to getting to know for a year is um, Ed the Tattooed Philosopher Boatman, um, who makes many, many, many odd deliveries to the people up in the islands. Um, and when I did a talk up there, they did it as a, as a community read um, on, on Friday Harbor. Um, I, you know, I mentioned that I, I had made this character up, and I said, I'm sure you don't have anyone like that. And <laughs> all the women in the audience said, <laughs> because it, it, Ed, Ed is quite the ladies' man. So um, he would be fun to live with for a year. And I think that there, at some point I will tie in um, the, the, the characters from another standalone, um, A Darker Place. There's these two teenagers, two, two children in there. One of them is a teenager and one of them is young. That I, I never was happy about just leaving. Because in the book, you just, they, they, you know, the book ends and they, you don't know what happens to them. Or even where they came from to begin with. Um, so I'd like to tie them together in there. You know, if I, if I only live long enough, I, I will be able to do all kinds of things like this. So. And, and if I, you know, if I stayed home working instead of coming to talk to you, right? <laughs> guilt, guilt, yes. It might seem like kind of a mundane question, but I'm always just curious about writer's process. So what's your day-to-day -day process or how you generally approach a new story? Um, the day-to-day -day process of Laurie King, the writer, um, it, it entirely depends on what stage the book is in. When I start a book, um, I have the kind of mind that compartmentalizes, and that's both good and bad. Um, it means that I, you know, I, I can ignore sideways things fairly efficiently. It also means that I get sucked into something just completely. Um, to the extent that I, more than once, I have found myself sitting at a stop sign. <laughs> um, at, fortunately, I live in a rural area and people know me and they say, oh God, she's got another book going. <laughs> Just drive around her. <laughs> um, but I, you know, so that when I have a first draft going, it it just completely consumes me. Um, I you know I really try to do nothing else, um, and it's it's painful when I have to um, draw away and go on on a book tour or something like that. Um, on on the other hand, um, 
I really enjoy the rewrite time. I mean, I, the first draft <clears throat> tends to be about 300 pages, which is far too short for, for a published novel. Um, that would convert into about 220 or 230 printed pages, which is a big novella. Um, and they, they don't pay as much for a novella, I guarantee you. Um, but my first draft is, I mean, it's not only a mess, a complete and utter mess, but it is completely garbled. I mean, the, the, only, the only person that I show it to is my editor, and that's only because she and I have worked together for so long, she knows how to read with one eye shut. And to just ignore the fact that you know, people are introduced out of nowhere, plot lines just fall off a cliff, um, you, you know, it, it, the action changes from one city to another without warning. You know, there'll be notes in my head or on a page saying, change this. But I, I don't want to stop what I'm doing in growing the plot to make it right. I don't need to. Sometimes I do, in which case I'll go back and see how things progress um, to reach the point. But for the most part, it, none of that stuff really matters. But it makes for a mess of a first draft. And, and then the, the actual rewrite process, which takes me longer than the first draft. If a first draft takes me two or three months, um, the rewrite will take four or five months. And during that time, the manuscript grows from 300 to 450 pages, that kind of thing. Um, but that's the craft. I mean, the rewrite is where I really feel like, like I'm getting my teeth into it. The first draft is just raw material. Um, and and it, it, it's reassuring to have a first draft because there is a story and there is a plot and there is an ending and I can see the book that I want to make out of it. But it isn't a book. Um, it's, it's an expanded outline. But to get into it and to do the rewrite and to make, to make that book do what you want it to do and to shape it so that every reader who picks it up is going to feel the same thing at that point. Um, I mean, that's, that's the fun part. That's the really the challenging part and the frustrating part. But the part that... You know, I've been doing this now for 21 books and for however many years since 1987. And, and I'm still feeling like, you know, this is, this is fun. This is really neat um, to get the book into a kind of shape, you know, to, so that you weave the, the bits of research in so that they're seamless. You don't notice that you're being told something. Um, and of course, in a mystery, you know, you also weave these little clues in so that you know there, there'll be there'll be clues in the introduction that um, that you don't know until you reach the point further on and you say wait a minute I did we and I love it when I you know I sneak them in on the writer that's that's the pleasure of being a, of a crime writer is that you're required to write that way the fun way <laughs> yeah <laughs> So now you're all going to go out and write crime books, right? Yeah. <laughs> Other comments and questions? Yeah. Uh, we were in Devon and had cream tea and came home and I read the war, and I swear that was the same place. <laughs> <laughs> My poor editor, she's so long suffering. I gave her books, and um, um, she had to finish the moor. The moor takes place in Dartmoor. Poor Mary Russell, she's always going to some place where it's bloody cold. I she just you know, I send her to India and they go up into the mountains and I send her to California and she ends up in San Francisco and it's foggy all the time and so you know I, I think I think she may actually get warm in Morocco come to think of it that'll be nice um, but my my editor will be reading these things and you know so she wrote me that she had to finish the more sitting in the bathtub because she felt so cold <laughs> and when she read. Um, um, o oh, Jerusalem, which is set in mostly in the, the desert in what was then Palestine. Um, Russell is, you know, she's wearing a boy's disguise. She half the time can't wear her glasses because she's in disguise. 
Um, she's with two men who, who really don't want her along. Um, and, and she's cold and, and hungry. And so the only thing, the only pleasure she has in that entire book is food. So my poor editor gained four pounds while she was reading it. Because <laughs> every time she'd finish a chapter, she'd have to go find something to eat because Russell made it sound so good, <laughs> even if it was just burned beans or something. But, so uh, my, my editor is long suffering. But, uh, but it is interesting how when you're, when, you, when you're writing a book like that, I mean, I am, as you probably can tell by now, not a deliberate writer. And when I get to the end of a, uh, of a book, um, I usually have to look back to see what I'm doing with it. And, and I think, oh, how clever of me. <laughs> because there's something in the back of my head that keeps track of you know, themes and images and so forth, um, and, and plays them over and over again in the course of the book. So that when I, when I finish a book like... Um, like O Jerusalem, I, I will look at it and say, yes, I am in this case using um, the, the idea of food and nurturing for all the stuff that she's not getting there. But it works in with the larger theme of what's going on in Palestine in 1919. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's usually at some point when I'm doing the rewrite that I look over the whole book and to see what it is that I'm trying to do with that. Where are the high points? What are the flavors I'm trying to, to leave in the, right, in the reader's mouth? And, um, and then as I'm finishing it up, I'll make sure, and there's little touches. It's sort of like the, you know, the bits of white paint on, a, on an oil painting. It's just those little touches that you want to bring out those themes. Um, so, which is the, the, the point that I'm at now um, in Pirate King, which is a lot of fun. Yes? Yeah, um, it's been years since I've read the Peaky Blinders. But, um, They're selling copies of it right over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, but, um, I, was, I was looking forward to um, the, the interplay between Mary Russell's um, divinity studies and Sherlock Holmes. And um, I was just wondering whether you felt that you had actually like, brought that out in the books, whether you felt good about that, or whether you felt that maybe there was going to be something more said about that. Um, religion and theology are, are a theme that run through um, a lot of the novels, but not all of them. Um, and, and as you say, um, Beekeeper's Apprentice doesn't really touch too, too firmly on that kind of, uh, on that, that side of her personality. Um, some of the other books do, um, Letter of Mary and um, Monstrous Regiment, to some extent, um, deal more with, um, in fact, Monstrous Regiment of Women. Um, Russell ends up tutoring a woman who is a religious leader in London. And interestingly enough, what she tutors the woman about is feminine aspects of God in the Old Testament, which happens to be what my MA thesis was on. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm such a good Californian. Reuse, recycle. <laughs> OK, can, do we have one more, one more question? Yep. Um, so I love Mary Russell novels, but I first encountered you through the Kate Martinelli novels. And I was just wondering when I might be able to spend more time with you. Poor Kate. Kate. Poor Kate, she gets left behind in the tumble, doesn't she? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know when I'm going to do another Kate. Um, I would like to do another two or maybe three. I think there needs to be a story arc there and that it is not happening at the moment. Um, there's a tremendous gap of time between between the, the you know the, the last couple of those, and um, I would like to I would like to return to Kate again. If I live long enough. <laughs> well, um, thank you all for coming out in this lovely room in this hot afternoon. Okay.
Okay, thank you so much to Lori King for being here this evening and to all of you as well. We have the ASUC bookstore here selling books and Mary's, I'm sorry, Lori's been kind enough to, <laughs> Mary who? Um, Lori's been kind enough to agree to sign those in the back. We also have Vikram's book there in case you wanna take it a chance and get his. Um, Thank you so much again for being here this evening. I hope to see you next month on December 2nd. That's the first Thursday of the month due to our final schedule for our students here on campus. So December 2nd for Gene Yang. He's the first graphic novelist we're showcasing at Story Hour, so it should be very exciting. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.